Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2019 Commemoration of Constitution Day. My name is Jane Sanchez, and I serve as the 25th Law Librarian of Congress. Constitution Day, officially known as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, is a federal holiday observed each year to commemorate the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787, and to, quote, recognize all who, by coming of age or by naturalization, have become citizens. Senator Robert C. Byrd of West Virginia included key provisions in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2005, designating September 17th as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. The act also required that public schools and governmental offices should provide educational programs to promote a better understanding of the Constitution. As such, the Law Library of Congress annually hosts Constitution Day programming to highlight the Constitution and the freedoms it grants all Americans. Although it was signed 230 years ago, it is the longest surviving charter of government that inspired democratic ideals and principles of freedom throughout the world. On your way in today, I hope you stopped to see a demo of our new Constitution annotated website that launched today. We've worked on this for years, as Karen Lewis can attest, and the Constitution annotated that we call Conan, like the barbarian, is the most comprehensive government-sanctioned record of interpretations of the Constitution. Conan is a source for anyone who wants to learn about America's founding document. It is still in print in hardbound editions, published every 10 years, with the next one scheduled in 2022. However, to keep up with Congress's fast-paced workflow in real time, the library and CRS spearheaded the modernization of Constitution Annotated. The new website URL is easy to remember, constitution.congress.gov. So today, I am very pleased to introduce Canon Shanmugam. Canon, welcome to the Library of Congress, and thank you for helping us commemorate Constitution Day. Canon is a partner in the law firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. He heads their Supreme Court and appellate court, appellate litigation practice, and is managing partner of the firm's Washington office. Cannon is widely recognized as one of the nation's premier appellate advocates, and he has argued 27 cases before the Supreme Court. I hope my numbers are correct. Several cases he argued were significant business and criminal cases. Beyond the Supreme Court, he has argued dozens of appeals in courts across the country. Cannon served as assistant to the Solicitor General at the U.S. Department of Justice. Born and raised in Lawrence, Kansas, he received an A.B. summa cum laude in classics from Harvard, an M. lit in classics from the University of Oxford, where he, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and a J.D. magnum cum laude from Harvard Law School. At the law school, Cannon was executive editor of the Law Review, and he argued for the winning side of the Ames Moot Court competition. After graduation, he served as law clerk to Judge J. Michael Lutig on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit and to Justice Antonin Scalia on the U.S. Supreme Court. Before we start, I wanted to mention that we are allowing some time at the end of, of, of Cannon's talk for questions and comments, and I encourage you to use that as an opportunity to jump into the conversation. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Jane. It is an honor and a privilege to give the Constitution Day speech uh, here at the Library of Congress, one of the nation's most important institutions, and in particular at the Law Library, the greatest library of its kind in the world. Thank you very much for inviting me to be with you. Now, when I was preparing to give this speech, my first question was, how did the tradition of Constitution Day actually begin? And as with many American traditions, the answer to that question is rather murky. Uh, it appears that the Iowa legislature was the first to provide for an official Constitution Day observance all the way back in 1911. Uh, it decreed that Constitution Day should be held today, September the 17th, the anniversary of the Constitution's signing. On the national level, Constitution Day was originally not even Constitution Day at all. After the legendary newspaper mogul William Randolph Hearst advocated for a national holiday to celebrate citizenship, Congress passed a law in 1940 to designate I Am an American Day. Uh, that day was later given the less catchy but more descriptive title of Constitution of Citizenship Day, and in 2005, as Jane mentioned, Congress officially redesignated September the 17th as Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. So I'm doubly honored to be your speaker for both holidays, and I intend to give my Constitution Day speech first, followed by my Citizenship Day speech. Uh, in all seriousness, you'll be pleased to hear that there's only one speech uh, today. Now, this is a particularly special occasion for me as the son of immigrants and first-generation American citizens and as someone who owes so much to this country and its constitution. My parents emigrated to this country from India in the 1960s. They came with few material possessions, but they came here in the belief that in America anything was possible. Even with that belief, I doubt that they would have ever imagined that some 50 years later, their son would be standing here in this place giving a speech honoring the American Constitution. But the genius of America is that there is nothing exceptional about my being here today. And in any number of ways, both big and small, it is the Constitution that made it possible. But I am here today not to talk about myself, but to talk about the Constitution. And this seems not just an appropriate day, but an appropriate time in our nation's history to reflect on the Constitution. As hard as it is to believe, we are a few months away from the start of a new decade, the 2020s. In that decade, we will celebrate the nation's 250th birthday, the semi-quincentennial, if you prefer. When I was born, the midpoint in our nation's history was in the, the 1870s, just a few years after the Civil War. The midpoint of our nation's history will soon be 1900. A longer period of time has now elapsed since Ronald Reagan's inauguration, 38 years, than between that inauguration and the end of World War II, 36 years. Yet while time moves on, our Constitution has remained remarkably static. It has been amended only once in my lifetime with the unusual ratification of the 27th Amendment in 1992. And if you want to read more about the 27th Amendment, you should go to the Constitution annotated. <laughs> in an era of rapid and profound social change, the Constitution stands serene and supreme. Now, the title of my speech today is The State of the Constitution. And as all of you know, the Constitution itself requires the President to give Congress a periodic report on the State of the Union. By the way, the Constitution does not require the President to do so in the form of a speech or even to do so every year. In their State of the Union addresses over the last few decades, our Presidents have almost invariably described the state of the Union as strong. But what about the state of the Constitution? Well, I am pleased to report today that the state of the Constitution is also strong. To begin with what all of us know, the Constitution is arguably the most important non-religious text ever written. The oldest written national constitution, it has served as the model for countless other constitutions worldwide. 
and its influence stretches well beyond new and developing countries. Just in the last decade alone, Britain created a Supreme Court that was plainly modeled on the United States Supreme Court in a worthy, if somewhat belated, effort to create a separation of powers similar to that in our own Constitution. To see the original Constitution in the National Archives, all four pages of it, is to feel a sense of awe at its simplicity and wonder at its longevity. The genius of our Constitution is that it establishes general principles that have applied across generations. In so many respects, the America of today bears little resemblance to the America of 1787 when the Constitution was signed. The founders could hardly have imagined that the President of the United States would communicate with the people primarily through a medium known as Twitter. And yet the fundamental structure of the government and the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution remain largely the same. On the rare occasion that the Constitution has codified mistakes, whether big ones such as slavery or smaller ones such as prohibition, the people have amended the Constitution to correct them. The founders could not have imagined how the Constitution is working today, but I think they would agree that it is, in fact, working. While the state of the Constitution is strong, however, that is not to say that it is perfect. There are always tensions in our constitutional system, and the Constitution is today facing certain challenges. I want to talk to you today about what I see as the most significant of those challenges, from the perspective of someone who practices law before the Supreme Court and who has worked in all three branches of government over the course of my career. And by way of a disclaimer, what I'm about to say is not a commentary on any particular president or Congress or Supreme Court. Rather, I intend to make some observations about important recent trends that bear on our constitutional system, trends that predate the incumbents in all of those offices. So, let me start with the basics. The fundamental focus of the Constitution is on the structure of our government and on the allocation of responsibilities between the three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. That is the subject of the first three articles of the Constitution, which make up the vast majority of the original text. The text says hardly anything about individual rights. Almost all of the guarantees of rights in the Constitution can be found in the Bill of Rights or later amendments. In fact, the founders believed that the separation of powers would itself provide ample protection for individual rights. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton even went so far as to suggest that the Bill of Rights was unnecessary. In his words, why should it be said that the liberty of the press shall not be restrained when no power is given by which restrictions may be imposed? While few today would go that far, it is certainly true that the limitations that the Constitution imposes on the branches of government, the so-called checks and balances, serve to protect individual freedoms by carefully enumerating the powers of government and ensuring that no one branch of government becomes too powerful relative to either the other branches or the public. The provisions of the Constitution governing the separation of powers have remained largely the same since the founding, with some minor tweaks such as the 17th Amendment, which provided for the direct election of senators, and the 22nd Amendment, which limited the president to two full terms. While the balance of power between the branches of government has shifted at various times in American history, the checks and balances between the branches have remained robust. But my basic thesis today is this. The balance of power right now is out of kilter in three ways. The resulting imbalance is having a distortive effect on our system of government, and it needs to be addressed. The first and most obvious structural problem involves Congress. In Article I of the Constitution, the founders literally started with Congress, and they viewed it as the predominant political branch. In fact, in drafting the Constitution, James Madison and others were concerned primarily with limiting Congress's powers so that it would not become too dominant. 
In recent years, however, the opposite has occurred. Congress has become dysfunctional and increasingly unable to address major policy issues. To begin with, Congress is simply passing fewer laws of any variety. In the 1970s and 1980s, Congress averaged approximately 700 laws per two-year session. In the last decade, Congress uh, is passing somewhere closer to 300 laws per session. In the current session, which began in January, Congress has thus far passed only 56 laws. And that number is, if anything, less impressive than it might sound. According to one study, about a third of the laws Congress passes are largely ceremonial ones that rename post offices, award medals, and yes, designate holidays like the one we're celebrating today. The problem with congressional dysfunction, moreover, transcends the political parties. While Congress passed a modestly greater number of laws in the 2017-2018 session, when one party controlled both houses, the power of the minority political party to threaten to filibuster legislation in the Senate today effectively ensures gridlock, regardless of who has majority control in each house. If anything, the situation is even more dire when it comes to major policy issues. To take an example, I suspect that everyone in the room would agree that the immigration crisis is one of the most important issues currently confronting our country. Yet there is no realistic possibility that this Congress will pass any sort of comprehensive immigration reform. In fact, the last time that Congress passed a major immigration law was in 2005, nearly 15 years ago. Think back to the last commercial you saw from a member of Congress running for re-election. Did that senator or representative claim credit for any specific legislative achievements? Probably not, because there aren't enough of them these days to go around. Now to be sure, a skeptic could argue that the dysfunction in Congress is not a bad thing, because the last thing we need is more legislation. That argument is not without force. In terms of sheer volume, we have plenty of laws as it is. And when Congress does act, it often does so with insufficient precision and insufficient heed for the limitations on its enumerated powers that the founders imposed. But my point here is simply that Congress's failure to confront major policy issues is creating a vacuum in our separation of powers. Now, why did Congress become so dysfunctional? Well, the answer to that question is beyond the scope of this speech. Many have cited the greater polarization of the two major political parties, with the result that members of Congress have less incentive to compromise, and indeed often an affirmative incentive not to compromise. Others have cited the fact that members of Congress spend less time in Washington, and therefore less time spent uh, on the process of lawmaking. The evidence also suggests that there is less time allocated for floor debates on proposed legislation, ironically at least in part because the Senate is devoting much of its time to considering judicial nominations, more on that subject a little bit later. But whatever the explanation, the status quo is beyond dispute. Congress is not robustly performing its function of making the laws. And that brings me to the second structural problem currently afflicting our system of government. The lawmaking vacuum left by Congress has largely been filled by the executive branch. Sometimes it is the president himself who fills the vacuum. Presidents of both parties, frustrated by congressional inaction, have increasingly been acting unilaterally through executive orders. But more often it is not the president, but rather a dizzying array of departments and agencies that have essentially replaced Congress in the business of lawmaking. In the best case scenario, those agencies engage in a process known as notice and comment rulemaking, which at least allows the public the opportunity to learn about and comment on proposed regulations before they become law. In the worst case scenario, those agencies dispense with the rulemaking process altogether and adopt interpretations of the law through more informal means, then seek to enforce those interpretations as if they were binding. At least in theory, when an agency adopts a regulation, it is purporting not to enact legislation, but rather to interpret legislation that Congress has previously enacted. In practice, though, many regulations look exactly like statutes, 
the kind of provisions that Congress enacts, or at least used to enact. In this library, the Code of Federal Regulations, which compiles all of the regulations promulgated by federal departments and agencies, now takes up almost as much shelf space as the United States Code, which compiles all of the statutes passed by Congress. And on the rare occasion that Congress does legislate nowadays, it often delegates broad authority to an agency to perform what is effectively a lawmaking function. Sometimes because it is more politically expedient merely to be seen to be legislating on a particular topic than to specify the details of the legislation itself, and sometimes because Congress simply cannot agree on those details and cedes the field to agencies instead. To make matters worse, Congress has not been content simply to pass the buck by delegating authority to agencies. It has attempted to insulate agencies from the president in an effort to ensure that presidents cannot completely control the lawmaking function either. In ceding the lawmaking field, Congress has created a class of so-called independent agencies that have effectively come to form a fourth branch of government. Thus, when Congress created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it placed dramatic and indeed unprecedented limitations on the president's ability to, remo to remove the bureau's director from office. And I should note that I'm currently involved in a case challenging the constitutionality of those limitations before the Supreme Court. Well, the problem with the reallocation of lawmaking authority from the legislature to these agencies is obvious. There is no branch of government more accountable to the people than the legislative branch, especially the House of Representatives, whose members are elected every two years. But there is probably no component of government less accountable to the people than the departments and agencies that line the streets of Washington. The employees of those agencies are well-meaning, but they scarcely resemble and often have little connection to the average Americans whose interests they represent. Rather remarkably, but perhaps unsurprisingly, when the Secretary of Agriculture proposed moving two components of his department from Washington to Kansas City, in the part of the country where American farmers actually, you know, farm, uh, he faced a massive revolt. And yet the employees of the Department of Agriculture and other government departments and agencies are accountable to the voters only indirectly through the president, if at all. The resulting imbalance between Congress and the executive branch, and worse yet, the fourth branch, is not what the founders had in mind when they established the constitutional separation of powers. The lawmaking vacuum left by Congress has been filled not just by the executive branch, but also by the judicial branch. And that brings me to the third structural problem that I want to dis discuss today. The founders contemplated that the judiciary would be, in the famous words of Alexander Hamilton, the least dangerous branch. Yet the judiciary and the legal system more generally play a larger role in American life today than the founders could ever have imagined. I was born in 1972, the week after Richard Nixon was reelected in a landslide. But in the nearly 50 years since then, the Supreme Court has waded into virtually every area of American life. And indeed, it is difficult to identify a major policy issue that the Supreme Court has not addressed, at least to some extent, during that time. Almost all of the major issues of the day are now ultimately resolved by the judicial branch. If you have any doubt about what I've just said about the growing role of the federal judiciary more generally, or the Supreme Court in particular, Try the following experiment. The Supreme Court issues its most important decisions every year at the end of June, when the court finishes its annual term. Next June, make a list of all of the subjects that those decisions touch. Then make a similar list of all of the subjects on which Congress has legislated over the last year. I am willing to wager that the first list will be longer and more substantial. Although the court has not yet filled its calendar for the upcoming term, it is already expected to issue major decisions on immigration, gun rights, gay and lesbian rights, religious liberties, and water pollution. It is a safe bet that Congress will not legislate in the next year on even a fraction as many substantial issues. What is more, the federal judiciary takes a muscular view of its role there is almost no matter that is thought to be beyond the judicial competence to resolve. 
Earlier this year, the Supreme Court refused to take up the question of whether gerrymandering, the drawing of electoral district lines to favor one political party over another, violates the Constitution on the ground that such claims presented political questions that were not subject to judicial resolution. But that was very much the exception that proves the rule, and the court came within one vote of reaching a different result. In the last 50 years, the Supreme Court has effectively decided a presidential election and addressed the most politically and socially divisive issues, often curtailing de democratic debate on those issues in the process. Now, my point here is not that any of those decisions was necessarily incorrect as a substantive matter. Instead, it is a more modest one. The federal judiciary is confident of its ability to resolve almost any issue. And rightly or wrongly, the American people have increasingly come to expect it to. I said that the lawmaking vacuum left by Congress has been filled both by the executive branch and by the judicial branch. As a result, perhaps not surprisingly, we have seen an increasing number of clashes between those two branches. As I alluded to earlier, there is currently a growing and important debate about whether executive branch agencies are entitled to deference when they interpret statutes or whether statutory interpretation is instead the exclusive province of the judiciary. Beyond that, however, it seems as if uh, every major executive branch action whether by a Republican president or by a Democratic one, is immediately challenged in litigation by well-organized political opponents, whether on the ground that the executive branch exceeded its constitutional or statutory authority, or on the ground that the executive branch reached its decision improperly as a matter of administrative procedure. In the last three years alone, we have seen such challenges to the president's so-called travel ban, his decision to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census, and his decision to reverse his predecessor's decision not to enforce the immigration laws against the Dreamers, all of which have ended up in the Supreme Court. Ironically, President Obama's previous policy on the Dreamers was also the subject of an immediate challenge, and it too ended up in the Supreme Court. I express no view here about the merits of those challenges, but as a result of those challenges, the judiciary has had the final word on many of the executive branch's most important policies. And once again, courts have exercised that authority muscularly, with a number of courts going so far as to enter nationwide injunctions against those policies, provoking a vigorous debate about whether a court in a single local district has such an expansive power. Given the growing role of the federal judiciary, it is not surprising that both political parties are increasingly focused on the process by which judges are selected, not just for the Supreme Court, but for the lower courts as well. As a result, the process by which our federal judges are confirmed has also become dysfunctional. As most of the major issues of the day ultimately end up in court, the confirmation process has come to focus ever more on outcomes, how judges will vote on particular issues, than on the quality of the judges being nominated and their dedication to the rule of law and to resolving disputes impartially. In particular, confirmation hearings have, quote, deteriorated into question and answer sessions in which senators go through a list of their constituents' most favored and most disfavored alleged constitutional rights and seek the nominee's commitment to support or oppose them. The words in that last quotation are not my own. They came from an opinion written by the man for whom I served as a law clerk, the great Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, nearly 30 years ago. Justice Scalia was predicting what would happen if the Supreme Court continued to decide major policy issues outside the democratic process. And in that prediction, he was entirely correct. Since the nomination of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court, the confirmation process has progressively deteriorated and the contagion has spread from the Supreme Court to lower courts as well. Whereas Justice Scalia was unanimously confirmed to the Supreme Court, less than four decades ago, senators of the opposite political party now reflexively oppose virtually all of a president's judicial nominees, even for the lowest courts. A recent study showed that three of the Democratic senators currently running for president had voted against every single one of the president's judicial nominees in this Congress, with two others voting against more than 90% of them. While judges are still being confirmed, 
That is entirely due to the coincidence that the President and the Senate are in the hands of the same political party. When that is no longer the case, whether because we have a Democratic President and a Republican Senate or vice versa, the confirmation process will surely grind to a complete halt. In addition, judicial nominees are now subject to a level of scrutiny far greater than even our elected officials, with opposition, opposition researchers going so far as to pour over college newspaper articles in an effort to unearth dirt that can be used in the confirmation process, as if such articles shed any insight on how a judge would rule on a case a generation or more later as an adult and as a lawyer. One might well wonder why any sane person would want to subject himself to that process. I can attest from firsthand knowledge that a growing number of the very best lawyers in the country, many of whom have led upstanding lives and would make magnificent judges, are simply saying, no thank you. I've come to the structural problem with the judiciary last, but it seems to me to be the most concerning. The judiciary is increasingly being viewed not as a neutral forum for adjudicating disputes according to objective legal principles, but rather as a third political branch. Under that view, law is simply politics by another means, the most expedient way of achieving political ends that, because of gridlock or other reasons, cannot be achieved democratically through the political process. In my opinion, that view is inimical to the Constitution. The growing perception that judges are simply politicians in robes is having a corrosive effect on our legal system and the rule of law. When I have a case in the lower courts, it is not unusual for a client to ask me whether the judges were appointed by Democratic or Republican presidents. Yet for the rule of law to mean anything, judges must be not above the political process, but it's outside it altogether and we must be able to attract the best and the brightest in the legal profession to serve in the judicial branch. I used to think that the structural problem with the judicial branch could be solved simply by appointing judges who take an appropriately restrained view of the judicial power, by faithfully interpreting the text of the Constitution and statutes, and according due respect to the coordinate branches of government. But I now think that in order to address that problem, we also need to address the other structural problems I have identified. As long as Congress is unable to act, someone will need to fill the lawmaking vacuum. And as long as the executive branch is attempting to fill that vacuum itself, the judicial branch will be called upon to review the executive branch's exercise of that authority. The beauty of the separation of powers our founders established is that the three branches of government operate as a kind of three-way teeter-totter. But if you've ever been on one, it is impossible to get a three-way teeter-totter to work when one of the participants in the game is not exerting any weight. That is why I believe that of the three issues I have identified, the most pressing is Congress's inability to act. At the beginning of this speech, I spoke about my parents. My father, who passed away two years ago, would often speak about what a special moment it was when he raised his right hand and took the oath of American citizenship. My wife, too, is an immigrant, and it was one of the most special moments of my life when Justice Scalia, my former boss, administered to her the oath of citizenship. Justice Scalia, too, was the son of immigrants, a common thread in our country's history. In that citizenship oath, new citizens swear that they will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. But in fact, all of us, whether new citizens or natural born ones, share that obligation. And on this day, this day that honors both the Constitution and citizenship, all of us need to redouble our own efforts to ensure that our system of government continues to operate as the founders intended. In this speech, I have identified a number of concerns about the Constitution. But I want to close with this. In fact, I have great optimism great optimism about the future of America and the continued vitality of our Constitution. President Reagan would often use the analogy that America was a city on a hill. If that is true, I think the Constitution is our lighthouse, the beacon that guides us uh, and guides us home through both calm and choppy waters. And uh, uh, our country faces very real challenges today. You might think that our country is 
um, uh, in choppy waters, but in fact it has come through far more troubled waters, uh, and in no small part that is thanks to the durability of our constitutional structure. Some 230 years after it was ratified, our Constitution continues to be the envy of the world. And for all of its flaws, our constitutional system remains the best system of government ever devised. Uh, there is certainly no country in which I would rather live, and in large part, that is due to the Constitution. As a lawyer practicing before the Supreme Court, it is a privilege to play a modest role in the functioning of that system. And it is a great privilege to have had the chance to celebrate Constitution Day with you here today. Thank you again for inviting me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Yes, ma'am. Is there any other president who has been denied the right to make a speech? Is there any other president besides President Obama who has been denied the right to make a Supreme Court nomination? Well, um, uh, I will say this without um, specific reference to what took place, ironically enough, in the wake of the passing of my former boss, Justice Scalia. As I said uh, in my remarks, we have seen a progressive degradation of the nominations process. Um, I traced it in my remarks to the nomination of Robert Bork because I think that that was the first time in modern history when a nomination to the Supreme Court was blocked really because of concern about the outcomes that the nominee would reach. But the reality is that um, I think folks on both sides in the confirmation process share that focus on outcomes. And I think that what has taken place with nominations in more recent years is entirely reflective of that. There was, of course, a vigorous back and forth in the Senate about whether a vacancy in the last year of a presidential term uh, uh, can and should be filled and about the historical precedent uh, on that, I'm not going to get uh, into uh, that debate. But what I will say is that I think our constitutional system in some sense tolerates what is taking place. After all, all that the Constitution says about the judicial confirmation process is first, that the president has the power to nominate, and second, that the Senate has the power to advise and consent to either approve or reject uh, the president's nominee. Uh, I am reminded of what Jane Austen said in one of her novels, and you'll forgive the inevitable gender imbalance to what I'm about to say. She said, when it comes to marriage, men have the power of choice and women have the power of refusal. <laughs> and in some sense, that is sort of the constitutional structure vis-a-vis uh, -vis the president and the Senate when it comes to judicial nominations. So uh, I think it's unfortunate. I think that it is noteworthy that uh, members of the Supreme Court uh, whether appointed by uh, Democrats or Republicans, have bemoaned this um, trend in the nominations process. Indeed, as recently as last week, Justice Ginsburg gave a speech in which she made uh, uh, the same point that I just did, that she wished that the confirmation process focused less on outcomes and more on the qualifications of judicial nominees. I can assure you that I wrote my remarks before I read Justice Ginsburg's speech. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I would surmise that the number of, as you were talking about, the numbers of laws has decreased markedly in the last several Congresses. How about the level of cases that the Supreme Court has accepted for cert? So that's a great question. Um, the number of cases that the Supreme Court is hearing has also declined. Um, but I think that that's a little bit of a misleading indicator, and I will explain why. Um, Justice Scalia was fond of telling his law clerks, uh, uh, in, inevitably when we were complaining about how hard we were working, that when he got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court was hearing somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 cases a year. The year before last, the Supreme Court heard 59 cases, and the court is now averaging somewhere between 60 to 70 cases 
per year. Um, the Supreme Court, unlike lower federal courts, is a court of discretionary jurisdiction. It gets to choose which cases it hears, which is a luxury that trial courts, district courts, and courts of appeals do not have. And there's no doubt that the Supreme Court is exercising that discretion more sparingly. The Supreme Court still seems to have plenty of space on its docket to decide what I think we would all agree are the most consequential issues is that list that I gave you um, from the upcoming Supreme Court term where the court has granted review in only about 35 cases so far, the court is still filling its term, reflects. Um, but I think you have to think about this holistically and you have to think about it not just in terms of the Supreme Court but in terms of the lower federal courts as well. The Supreme Court will typically grant review only when the lower courts are in disagreement on a point of law. I think the Supreme Court views it as its primary task to essentially referee disputes that arise in the lower courts on questions of law. So what has, I think, happened in recent years is that the lower courts have actually gotten pretty good at, at, at reducing the number of times that they create those conflicts and sometimes avoiding creating those conflicts entirely. But again, I think that the trend towards the muscular exercise of um, the judicial power you know, remains unabated even with the decline in the number of cases that um, the Supreme Court hears. So, you know, it isn't as if Congress in um, passing fewer laws is still passing a lot of major legislation. <laughs> in fact, Congress is passing um, fewer minor laws and fewer major laws. The Supreme Court, by contrast, continues to decide year in and year out, regardless of which president is nominating uh, new justices incredibly consequential issues for American life. And again, my point here today is not to comment on particular outcomes, but simply to note the fact that the Supreme Court is uh, uh, really serving as the final arbiter on so many issues, and I think in part because of the dynamic in the other two political branches that I discussed today. Uh, several questions, I'll let the person with the microphone be the referee. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. You spoke about, uh, first, thank you for your speech. Um, you spoke about uh, Congress's gridlock. In your opinion, what can be done to um, jumpstart uh, productivity in Congress and, Congress and help overcome the gridlock? You know, as I said, I think that that's a very difficult issue, and in some sense, I think it's probably above my pay grade as uh, a, a Supreme Court advocate. Um, I just deal with what comes out. I don't deal with uh, what goes in. But I do think that um, all of the factors that I identified have been um, noted by people who are closer observers than uh, I am of the legislative process. I do think that um, there is certainly um, less bipartisanship today um, and a greater degree of polarization between the political parties. Um, and again, there are a lot of factors that have probably contributed to that, but certainly there doesn't seem to be much willingness to compromise in Washington these days. Um, the reality is that Washington is, uh, uh, this will come as news to everyone, rather unpopular in the rest of the country, and as a result of that, I think it's very hard for members of Congress to spend any more time here than uh, they absolutely have to. And you've seen sort of the shrinking of the legislative week. You've seen members of Congress sleeping in their offices because they don't even want to be said to have real estate in Washington. And you see them leaving as soon as they can to go back to their districts. Now, I don't subscribe to the view that that does not work. Um, knowing my um, uh, members of Congress from my home state of, of Kansas, I can attest that they work incredibly hard and they travel you know, long distances to meet with their constituents and to address their constituents' problems. But the fact remains that I think that members of Congress these days really don't have a lot of time to get to know each other because they are here for so little time. I also think that there has been some fascinating research done, and again, I'm no expert on this, I'm, I'm purely a citizen when it comes to this, um, about the limitations on debate, the way in which bills are presented to members, uh, and I can attest to this a little bit just from anecdotal experience as a Supreme Court advocate. Uh, much of what I do is to argue cases about the meaning of statutes. And when you're preparing for such an argument, uh, you inevitably look to the history of laws, to the debates in Congress. Some members of the Supreme Court are more willing than others to credit those debates, but you certainly have to do your homework and read them. And it is really striking to go back 30 or 40 or 50 years and to read legislative history of congressional statutes because often on the floor of Congress you would see these remarkably learned debates about 
subsections of obscure laws and the effects of those subsections. And that just does not happen today. And again, I don't want to get into a normative discussion about why that doesn't happen. But you know, when major laws are passed today, often you will have members of Congress saying with a straight face that they have to pass the law first so that they'll know what's in it, as famously happened in the case of a major piece of legislation uh, a few years ago. And so I think that there has been a decline, not just in the quantity of legislation, but in the quality of, of what we would all consider to be traditional legislative debate. And again, I think that that, that is, I identified that problem first because I think in some sense, that is the problem from which the other problems I discussed today really flow. Um, does the lack of uh, a common understanding of how to interpret laws, does that affect the perceived politicization of the judiciary? I mean, your boss wrote a book, you know, that thick on how to interpret laws. Other justices wouldn't agree with that. If you don't have a, you know, you, you mentioned objective principles. If you don't really have common objective principles, what else do you have but political leanings? So I think that there is, um, you know, certainly a vigorous debate about what the objective principles should be. Though I would also say that when it comes to statutory interpretation, there's been a significant amount of convergence among uh, judges and justices, I think in large part due to Justice Scalia, um, that the discussion at a minimum should focus first on the text of statutes and then and, and only then uh, on secondary considerations. So I think that the, the, the disagreements about those objective principles are not perhaps as great as they might seem. But certainly I don't mean to minimize the fact that there are legitimate disagreements, including on the Supreme Court, about the correct way to go about constitutional interpretation and the correct way to go about statutory interpretation. And those are debates that I think are entirely legitimate debates to have. Yes, there were several other questions here, so I'll, I'll try to answer quickly so we can get through as many of them as possible. So I'd like to ask whether you are interpreting the strength of the Constitution in terms of its efficiency, in terms of how it conforms to the original balance of powers concept, or in any degree in reference to with how democratic an, uh, a system of government uh, it is providing. And it seems to me that in recent years, we've uh, been reminded uh, of the lack of democratic origins and uh, the limitations on democracy where we've had a succession of presidents that were not elected by a majority vote and we have a Senate that's obviously not elected but in proportion to the population uh, having so much power. Sure. So um, as I think all of us learned in, um, you know, 11th grade American history or whenever you took American history in high school, you know, the founders established not a democracy but a republic, a democratic republic to be sure. And if you actually look at the three branches of government, I think they've become progressively less democratic. Certainly the Congress is very democratic, at least now, now that we have the direct election of senators and it bears remembering that we did not have that for a large chunk of our nation's history. The president was always meant to be ever so slightly insulated by virtue of the electoral college, by virtue of a system that uh, interposed uh, electors between the voters and the president, which uh, has resulted, of course, in recent years in uh, the uh, uh, individual who won the total popular vote not winning the presidency. And whether or not you like that system and whether or not you think it needs to be changed, there can be no doubt that that was very much the founder's original design. And then, of course, at the end, you have the judiciary, which is, you know, intended to be insulated from democracy with the protections of uh, life tenure and the selection process for the judiciary. I do think that while I think the separation of powers works well in the sense that the checks and balances are by and large operating as the founders intended, you could make the argument that much of what I said today is about the reduction in um, uh, sort of power going to the people, the, the rise of judicial power, the rise of the power of uh, unelected uh, administrative officials in cabinet departments and agencies. Um, and, you know, again, I think that the founders contemplated some degree of that, 
But whether they contemplated the degree to which that has happened in recent times is, I think, open to question. Other questions, or at least a couple in the back row. I recognize that gentleman over there. Yes, sir. Hi there. Uh, well, it was a wonderful presentation today. Um, could you say just a little bit more, though, about how you see the relationship between the first and second problems that you've identified uh, and the third? You seem to suggest that there's a, a causation between the first two and the third, but you might wonder you know, you know, why that is. It might be that, or why wouldn't you think that a Congress that was pretty robust and active uh, and an administrative state and an executive branch that was relatively more hemmed in would still lead to the same sort of situation we have today with uh, the federal courts ultimately being the deciders of the constitutionality of what Congress did. So I can imagine the first problem not being a problem, but still having uh, perhaps an oversized and over-important federal court yeah, system. Yeah, I think my answer to that would be, I don't think that, um, that, that all of this flows from um, congressional inaction. I think congressional inaction is probably the greatest cause of the issues that I discussed um, today. But I think that if you had a system where Congress was robustly legislating, and the Supreme Court was playing its, uh, and, and the federal courts were playing their constitutionally appointed roles, which are of course first um, to make sure that Congress is acting within its enumerated powers and not exceeding the many, many specific powers that are allocated in Article I of the Constitution. And number two, to ensure that individual rights are protected under the individual guarantees uh, 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 in the Constitution, that that would be closer to the system that um, the founders intended, at least if you assume that the founders intended Marbury versus Madison and a robust system of judicial review. Um, and so I think that what is unusual, and I really mean this in a nonpartisan way, is the extent to which now we are seeing executive action followed by immediate judicial review. And again, you know, I think if you want evidence of that, you need look no further than uh, the initiatives concerning uh, the so-called dreamers that I alluded to, where you really have this remarkably symmetrical litigation where, you know, you had President Obama announcing this policy of not enforcing the immigration laws against the dreamers, a challenge that was brought in what the challengers thought was a friendly forum, a nationwide injunction followed by a Supreme Court review, Parenthetically, I would note that the Supreme Court divided four to four because Justice Scalia had passed away in the interim, and so they did not actually opine definitively on the merits of the program, which is sort of what has triggered the second round of Supreme Court litigation. And then President Trump saying, I've changed my mind on that policy. Challengers bringing challenges, again, in carefully selected districts, nationwide injunctions issuing, and Supreme Court review. And I think that that does sort of neatly illustrate that this is a pattern. This is not specific to this administration or any particular administration. This is the way in which major policy issues are increasingly being worked out. I feel like I should not conclude on that joyous note. So, uh, <laughs> sir, a question in the back row. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could expound a little bit on you twice cited the Bork nomination as the beginning of, I think you said, a progressive degradation in the nomination process or the confirmation process. But that seat was ultimately unanimously built for Justice Kennedy. And then subsequently, Justice Ginsburg was seated virtually unanimously. Breyer was pretty close. Souter was not far behind. So I'm not sure how you see that as sort of a straight progression. And I'm wondering if I mean, certainly there was, there was political elements in the Bork discussion that might have been novel, but I'm not quite sure how, why you see that as, a, as the beginning of a Yeah, I think that's a fair point. It was not a completely straight line. You did have Clarence Thomas in there. That was, uh, uh, you know, a, an unusual confirmation, at least until the most recent confirmation. Um, but I think that there, you know, it, it is not an even line. Though I do think that you could make it an even line if you started, you know, after Breyer, because I think that the number of opposing votes had, had gone up with every single uh, nominee uh, after that, you know, maybe with, with very slight variation. But I think that the broader point does hold. I mean, my point is first that the Bork nomination was really, you know, the first one, again, at least in modern times, where the debate was really framed in terms of outcomes. You know, starting with um, Senator uh, uh, Kennedy's sort of famous speech about the consequences of uh, a Bork confirmation and really progressing throughout that debate. 
And again, what we're seeing and what I think is very concerning for those of us who are lawyers who care about the rule of law is that now that is taking place with almost every nomination at almost every level. It used to be that this practice was very much focused on the Supreme Court, but now nominees for lower courts are routinely being asked whether they think that particular decisions were correctly decided, and you have, you know, again, this almost reflexive opposition to nominees. And while one could blame, you know, the, the, the particular senators who I mentioned for uh, their opposition to literally everyone who this president has nominated, I think that there is once again a bipartisan quality to this dynamic. And as I said, if we had a Democratic president and a Republican Senate, I'm sure that there would be, you know, virtually no one, if anyone, who would get confirmed, and vice versa. And I think that if we go through a period like that, it is going to have really significant consequences for the federal judiciary at every level. You know, and, and of course, if we had a Supreme Court that was um, hamstrung for an extended period of time by uh, uh, no one getting confirmed to the court, you know, the court was able to, um, uh, to get through such a period uh, after the death of Justice Scalia. But we, I think we could be talking about an extended period of time where that takes place, two years or four years or longer. And I think that it is really hard to predict the effect that that would have on the Supreme Court, and certainly it would have a significant effect on the lower courts as well if we had such a period. I see um, two more questions, uh, three more questions. I think I only have time for one, so I'm going to leave it to our, uh, our microphone holder to decide who, who is first. <laughs> I would just like to comment that in addition to the fact about the partisanship in, in the nomination process, we have organized groups that are advocating uh, for, for the judiciary candidates who have a direct uh, and a very clear motivation on how they're going to uh, vote on certain issues. And the, and the quality of their nomination wasn't based on their qualifications, but the fact that they were pushed by the, an advocacy group of some sort. Well, you do see um, these commercials, both for and against nominees, um, which are you know, perhaps not coincidentally targeted to so-called swing states or states where senators may be up for re-election, that sound a lot like campaign ads um, on um, the very issues we've been discussing. And you know, I think the moment when I sort of first realized that you know, the confirmation process, at least for the Supreme Court, you know, bears more resemblance to a political campaign than it does to a, a traditional confirmation was when uh, immediately after uh, President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court, the White House on its website released a sort of glossy commercial, there's really no other word for it, um, sort of introducing Merrick Garland to the American people with the sort of, um, you know, uplifting music that you usually see in those um, introductions that take place uh, at political conventions. And again, that's not a criticism of President Obama because I think that the, the current president has done much the same thing with his two uh, nominees. But I do think that, you know, there is a sense in which uh, these nomination processes look a lot more like election campaigns and millions of dollars are being poured into them. And, um, and I think that that is uh, just, uh, you know, reflective of the fact that, again, this process has come to be, you know, more about outcomes from all sides, uh, again, supporters and opponents alike. Well, I think with that, we're out of time. I'm happy to answer any other questions one-on-one -on -one, uh, afterwards, but thank you all again for coming today.